Welcome to our United Summer Services. Whether you're a member of our churches, visitors, or watching online, we are glad to have you as part of our worship. Activity packs for children's use during the service are available in the vestibule. A creche facility is available in the Coulter Hall throughout the service. Members of Second Valley East and PW Committee are asked to remain behind at the end of the service for a short meeting. The Sacrament of Baptism will be observed at morning worship next Sunday morning, 16th of July. Members of both congregations who wish to play with the praise band on Sunday the 30th of July will be made most welcome. Please speak to Connor after the service to find out more. We hope you will join us for a pop luck lunch in the grounds of the parade manse on Sunday the 30th of July after morning worship. Due to the growing number of girls in First Valley East and BB, GB, sorry, they really need a few extra helpers for starting in September. If you think you could lend a hand in any way, please speak to Lucinda Jones or Joanne Hartness. The sympathy of both congregations is extended to the family of Rabina Cahoon, better known to all as Beanie, who died on Friday the 7th of July. Please pray for her children, Elaine, Jim, Gillian and Mark and their families, her sister Wilma Graham, brother-in-law John and their family, and her brother-in-law Jim Reed and the extended family circle. A service of thanksgiving will be held in First Valley Eastern Presbyterian Church on Monday the 10th of July at 10.30 a.m., followed by interment in Rishi Cemetery. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. These are today's announcements for your consideration and prayers. God, we come with questions. We struggle with patience. We come in search of answers, yet we journey with uncertainty. But still we put our trust in you. And so as your people gather together, let us worship God.
Psalm 13. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Happy or sad, God listens. When we are by ourselves or with our friends, God listens. When we are busy or sitting quietly, God listens and answers prayer. And so together, we pray as Jesus taught us to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> now that we're in holiday season, I think I'll just bring the adults up to the front. We've, don't worry, kids, I'm not going to drag anybody up here. So how good is your memory? I'm not sure mine is terribly good because no sooner had I got here this morning than I realized I'd forgotten my reading glasses and had to walk all the way back to the manse. Yes, I've reached that age, Bellis, and you have aged me. But what about your memory? How good are you at remembering things? So, Gardner, are you any good at timing? I'm going to show you a picture in a moment, and you're going to get 60 seconds to see some things on the screen, and then we'll see after that. Are you ready, Gardner, to give us 60 seconds of a picture? Now, how good are you at remembering? First question, how many things were there? I mean, if you're going to try and remember things, you might want to count them. I mean, I hope none of you are teachers, because if you take a class away, you better have counted them to make sure you've got all them back. Not necessarily the same ones, but a rough number. <laughs> Ten. Well done. That's the first thing you've got to do to remember. Now, hands up if anybody knows what any of the things were that were scrambled from the manse and the mess. Anything? What was that? What's that, Ronnie? They're shouting? Butter. Butter. That was quite right. Yes, from the fridge. A tomato. Yes, there was. Jam. Jam. There was. I made it as well. It's very good. And I heard headphones from Jane. Anything else? How many things have we got? We've got jam. We've got butter. We've got headphones. We've got tomato. So that's four. A marker. So that's five. Post-it note, six. Two handsets. A phone, yes. And a remote. That's up to eight, I think it is. Anything else? Marker. We've already had the marker, sorry. Torch, nine. No sharpener. It's going to be difficult, that one, actually, because there were two small things. You'll not get them, I'm pretty sure. There were two batteries. Gardner, there's our 10 things. Well, you've got most of your marbles. This is not too bad. Walter just read the psalm, which we're going to be thinking about. Today we're thinking about prayer, and the psalm is a bit like a prayer, but the psalmist was worried. He was worried that God might be a bit like me coming over from the manse in the morning and forgetting things. Worse, we're not very good at remembering sometimes. If we're too busy or we're rushed, 
we forget. And so the psalmist thought, maybe if God is like that, what if God's forgotten me? And they were worried and scared. But the psalm reminds us, as old as the Bible, that God never forgets us. God can never forget us. In fact, God holds us, each of us, in God's attention all the time. And we never have to be afraid. And that's what we're going to think about today. And if any of the boys and girls want an activity pack, remember we've got them in the vestibule. Connor. <coughs> So as we reflect on prayer and what we do as God's people gathered in church, let's pray. A prayer of confession. God who holds us in the depths and on the mountain top, we seek your face in worship. We seek your face to shine on our questions, on our certainties, on our challenges, on our consolation. Here in this place, we know the freedom to sing your praise, while we also ask, how long, O Lord? How long before we see justice in your world? How long before we see peace in your world? How long, O Lord? Even as we ask these questions, we acknowledge our complicity in all that ails our world. We confess that often we do not play our part in sharing love, in holding out peace. The things we do too often discriminate and make your kingdom less. Lord, hear our confession, our cry for forgiveness, and our pledge with your Spirit's help, to do better. And then help us who know we can count on your love and your forgiveness to go and make a difference in this world, to use what you reveal to us here to restore creation according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
according to John. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all of those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Thanks be to God. Well, last Sunday, if you were here, was noisy. We had party blowers in our old age service, and uh, we were looking at the theme of joy. This month, we're thinking about what is church about? What do we do as God's people? What's our purpose? And joy, as we thought last week, is at the heart of our faith. Here we discover joy. It's the very start as C.S. Lewis said, as he was surprised by joy, as he wrote, when he looked back over his life, trying to work out why was he a Christian? And at the heart of his faith was joy that had sprung up on him in spite of everything he had done to resist it. And I hope that we provide as many instances of joy for our children to experience in the context of worship and Sunday club or holiday Bible club or GB or BB or the parents and others or whatever we do. And also for you, young at heart, adults, to showcase joy at the heart of faith, the surprise that God loves us. Grace is amazing. 
And then after church, I appreciated the time over coffee to catch up with folk and loved hearing about people's plans for upcoming holidays or what you're going to be doing that day with your family. Lovely morning, good company, encouraging worship. Then I went to the manse, thinking about what to have for lunch, where to take the dog for a walk that afternoon, friends I'd be catching up with. And as I got in, there was a message that my cousin John had been contacting all the family to say that my father's brother, Uncle Jimmy, had died last Sunday morning. Life comes at us from every direction. One minute we're enjoying the sun blazing across the landscape, and then we suddenly find ourselves plunged into the gloom of downpours. Church is about joy, being together, celebrating God's grace to us, revealed in Jesus. But this isn't Instagram. We aren't stupid. Life is painful and sad and hard and bleak at times also. Hospital results bring dread, a telephone call rings in terrible change, an email evokes dismay. There is a lot of pressure, not simply for celebrities, online to always present a vision of ourselves that is relentlessly positive. And most of us do do that. Our Facebook posts or whatever are more about celebrations and anniversaries than problems. And our Instagram posts like to share the fun things. It was my dog's two-year-old birthday yesterday. He got lots of pictures taken for people to like. There's nothing wrong with sharing the successes of family members. There's nothing wrong with holiday pics. It seems a lot of people are going to Legoland in Second Valley Easton. There's nothing wrong with daft dog pics and memes and silly WhatsApp chat groups. But you come home from holidays and have as many, if not more, disappointments with yourself, others, and life in general also. The holy grail of perfection in both church and society moral, spiritual, financial, physical, psychological, familial, vocational, is so seductive. But in the end, it's the voice of the oppressor, wrote Dan Clenadon last month. In psychology, in my training, I have seen how it perverts minds and bodies, affecting young women and men with eating disorders and body dysmorphia for something that is a false idol, and the amount of effort that they take to put into hiding what's really going on, and to try and pretend that everything's okay. I remember the first time I was being in the eating disorders unit, my tutor was sitting in her office, and she told me to look out all the offices because where we were had glass walls. So I was looking out in the waiting area, and she said, look. And I said, well, there's a crowd of people. What else do you see? And I said, well, there's this, that, and there's so many people, and the rest. She says, you're not looking. Look again. And then I realized they all had big liter bottles of water because they were getting weighed that day and they were drinking as much liquid as they could to try and pretend that their weight was all right. Such is the disease of anorexia, for instance. So much effort for a cruel illness that causes people to try and portray a false idea of who they are. I've watched families tear themselves apart as well over a misguided belief as to what family should be, that everyone has to conform in a certain way. Or in religion, we see how it perverts denominations that idolize purity, ignorant of the actual lives of people, and lead those denominations further into irrelevance, worse as the scandals in Hillsong or sole survivor in the Church of England, these great big evangelical groups, covering up abuse of vulnerable people, all to cover up a perfect image. Falsehood is oppressive. Here in church, we do live with joy. Joy at the good news of Jesus, joy in the company of each other, joy next in this coming week with a wedding. We've got a rehearsal on Monday night and the wedding on, I can't remember, Saturday. Don't worry, bride, I'll be there. And a baptism on Sunday, definitely, Eddie, don't worry, I'll make sure that's taking place. But joy only has value if it is 
authentic. Our worship only has value if it is authentic. And that we recognize that joy is often also a companion to despair. Here in the psalm we read today, we get a realistic balance. It's a psalm, it's a prayer for help. Things are not okay. And it's one of the shortest psalms that give voice to the pain at the heart of whoever that psalmist was. The 19th century Baptist preacher Spurgeon called it the howling psalm. How long, O Lord? How long, how long, how long? A cry for help. They feel abandoned. Even God has failed them. Worse, not just that it feels that God has forgotten them, but that God has actively turned their back on them. And instead of God's presence to support them, everything is conspiring against them. How long, O Lord? As we think about what we do in church this month, we're thinking about prayer. But our prayer, like joy, only has value if it is authentic. And Psalm 13 holds out this authenticity, which can too often be lacking in church life. True prayer means to bring your true self into God's presence because God can't save a fake version of you. When you pray, it's okay to be you, to share your deepest feelings with God, to be honest. And part of growing in your Christian faith is to recognize that God loves you and to accept that God loves you. Not a fake you or a mask you put up for others, but you. There's a story told about the 16th century nun and Catholic reformer, Teresa of Avila, that she was making her way to the convent in a fierce rainstorm when she slipped and slid down a big embankment and fell squarely into the mud. And the story goes that she looked up to heaven and admonished her maker, if this is how you treat your friends, God, no wonder why you have so very few of them. Yet, while that story is highly unlikely to be true, in her ministry and life, the continuing appeal of her writings to so many comes from the fact that she was joyous and humorous and self-deprecating. She sounded human, authentic. The good news is the psalm doesn't simply leave us lost in Spurgeon's howl. Opening up our authentic selves, the psalmist remembers also the place of praise in life. But there is recognition of present trouble but also recognition that everything passes. Luther, writing about this psalm, calls the mood of the prayer the state in which hope despairs, and yet despair hopes at the same time. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me recognizes the psalmist because they trust God, regardless of the current situation, because God has been good to them in the past and God is good, which is the promise for the future. Why does it matter that our prayer, our worshiping life is to be authentic? As the different denominations, not just Presbyterian, all the rest of them think about the future and how they're going to adapt in the years to come. Christians need to be able to lead authentic lives. And if a denomination can't help them fulfill that calling, then it deserves a decent funeral. The late Rachel Held Evans, who sadly died all too young, wrote about trying to live an authentic life and faith. She was famous, had one of the best-selling books in the world, because she tried for a year to live faithfully as a biblical woman doing everything literally that she read from the Bible. And it was a way of looking how, what on earth does faith actually mean in real life? And it's very funny. She even said she tried to obey her husband, the silliest thing of all. But she was profoundly interested in how did her generation, younger than mine, find faith? And if they found faith, what kept them? Churches that tried to look cool might look shiny on a Sunday or online, but if they lacked enough depth, nobody would stay. And she wrote before she died, millennials aren't looking for a hipper Christianity, we're looking for a truer Christianity, a more 
authentic Christianity. Like every generation before ours and after, we're looking for Jesus, the same Jesus who can be found in the strange places he's always been found, in bread, in wine, in baptism, in the word, in suffering, in community, and among the least of these. That search for authenticity begins in our prayer life, both on a Sunday or late on a Wednesday evening or in a walk in the woods or maybe even a howl during a week stuck in a traffic jam. Psalm 13 teaches us what that kind of authentic faith prayer looks like. Yes, there is praise, but also bold and brutally honest confessions of abandonment, inner turmoil, defeat, or fearing the worst, because your very own life is an authentic prayer to share with God. And what happens when you pray like this? When you open yourself up to God? This is how Jesus describes the answer to your prayers, to your true self. And this is the will of him who sent me that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Amen. We worship God with our offering. Let us pray. God, who is there through all our highs and lows, whose patience knows no end, we bring our offerings to make a difference in every corner of your world. God, hear our cry for our world in distress, for all who suffer and cry out for justice, for all who are separated from family and loved ones. For all who have lost hope that things will ever be better. God, hear our cry for your church throughout the world as she seeks to find a way to be your hands and feet, as she seeks to find a way to be inclusive, to be affirming, to bring light and love into darkness and fear. God, hear our cry for ourselves and those whom we love the bereaved, the lost, the lonely, those weighed down with sorrow and loss, those who watch through the night and pray for the light of dawn, especially the family of Bini Cahoon. And as we cry, how long? Give us your eyes to see, your heart to love, and your compassion to make a difference right where we are. God, while we see the immediate, you see the past, the present, and the future. 
while we struggle with the issues of today, you promise your faithfulness forever. While we lose patience, you, God, are a God who waits with us, for you know the plans you have for us are plans for good. You, God of all time, meet us in this time and in this week ahead, walk with us in darkness and in light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you, now and always. And all God's people said, Amen.